I'm going to be giving an overview to all the different tools that are in the GraphQL ecosystem. So you can get a good idea of all the popular ones and also I'll give you an idea of the ones I recommend using and in which circumstances they are a good idea to use. So what I'd like to start with is which program language should you actually use with GraphQL? This video is going to be focused on the JavaScript and TypeScript ecosystem because it is the largest and I guess the easiest to learn because there's a lot of examples and a lot of support for it. But note you can use GraphQL with whatever language you want to. Okay, so I want to start with first, there's basically two popular ways to, well, one popular way and one that's less popular. Um, this is the most popular way to create a schema in GraphQL. So this technique is known as schema first, and it's something that Apollo made popular. And so basically the idea of GraphQL is you need to create some schema with your types. So with this, we are having a uh, our types over here on the left, and we basically separate it with this schema first approach. So you can see we have some different types. Right, type query, post, and user. And then we define, for example, the data type, so strings, and this is a field is data type user. And then in our, and you'll notice this is just a string, right? And then in your code, you'll actually write some functions that resolve these fields. And so you split basically the look of your schema or your definitions with your actual resolvers, is what these are called with basically the logic. So this has a couple advantages. Um, one, it's very popular right now, so there's a lot of libraries that have support for it. And the other big one is it's very easy to read. It's very readable. Um, when you look at this, you can cr like quickly grasp all the different types very quickly. The other approach, which is less popular, but has some nice advantages, is the code first approach. What you're looking at right here is from GraphQL Nexus. So that's a particular library that you can create a schema with. And uh, this is what it looks like to create a simple GraphQL type. So here you can see we have an object type, which is a query. Then we have a string, which says hello. Uh, well, it's the name of the field, and the field's a string. It takes some arguments. And then here you can see here's the function right, to resolve that field. So you can see with the code first approach, you actually are integrating into your language, whereas back to here, you just write the schema as a string. So the cool thing about code first is you can get some really nice auto completion. And the thing that I like about it best is that it's very easy to split up your schema and have everything together. And especially if you're using TypeScript, code first is gonna be the way to go because you can get some really nice integration between TypeScript and uh, GraphQL and not having to repeat the types. When you use something like this, it's actually kind of a nightmare to get TypeScript working with it nicely. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention about code first is this is not the only way to write schema. This just happens to be the syntax that GraphQL Nexus supports. Another library is called Type GraphQL and they use uh, decorators. So you can see this is a similar um, query to what we were just looking at. So we decorate it, this class with a resolver and then we say this is a query. This query returns a type string. And it's a hello query, takes an argument, and it returns a string. So you can see it's a JavaScript function here. Well, this is a TypeScript code, but uh, it's just a function. So this is another way you could actually define your schema. So personally, what I end up doing is using the code first approach. So we'll talk about which one you should be using. I would recommend starting with the schema first approach because it's right now the most popular and I think it's the easiest to learn. And when you learn it, it helps you just know more about GraphQL and how to make and actually query stuff. I think it's like a good place to start with. Uh, but then after that, especially if you're gonna do TypeScript, you're gonna run into problems trying to do the schema first approach. Um, and so I much prefer switching at that point to the code first. So like once you have a good understanding of how to set up the schema like that, um, I would recommend switching to a code first approach. So I would start with Apollo and GraphQL tools like that, and then either pick GraphQL Nexus or type GraphQL when you wanna do code first. And I'm gonna get more into which one of these guys you should pick um, later.
Basically what it comes down to is if you're using something called Typeform, you should use Type GraphQL. And if you're using Prisma, you should use GraphQL Nexus. And if you're using neither of those things, you should just pick the one that you like the syntax of the best. All right, so the next one is which server should you use with GraphQL? So there's a couple different choices. The most popular one is Apollo server, and this is the one I use and I would recommend you starting with for sure. Now when you pick Apollo server, you actually get to choose four different types of, or you can choose from four different types of actually underlying servers. So Apollo is basically some middleware that sits on top of an actual server and makes the GraphQL stuff easier for you to do. So you can choose from Express, FastFi, Koa, Happy, and here, just pick your favorite server. I personally use Express um, because it's most popular, but really you can't go wrong with any of these. The next one to consider that's in the ecosystem is called GraphQL Yoga, um, but that one I would not suggest using right now because it's just not up to date. Um, they are making a switch and building out Yoga 2, um, and when Yoga 2 comes out, I would recommend trying this out again, but it's still in a, a work in progress state. Um, so until then, I'm not really uh, suggesting GraphQL Yoga. The other one is Express GraphQL. This one is a kind of a lighter weight server. So if you're interested in something less heavy than Apollo server, uh, give that one a try. Last one is Nest.js. So this one, you're gonna have to give it a try and see if you like it. Um, I felt like when I tried it, it was a little boilerplate heavy and I didn't like basically the style of building a server. Um, but if you like that style, um, I think it could be really nice in a large project and really helpful, the structure of everything. Um, but personally, I enjoyed the Apollo server and Express setup more. Um, so really, I, I think it comes between, take a look at Nest.js and Apollo server. I think those are really the top two choices um, for servers. And then it comes down to which syntax you like better there. All right, next one is what database should you use. And with GraphQL, you can actually choose whatever database you want. Personally, I use Postgres, but you could use Mongo. You could also choose things like Elasticsearch, which aren't like exactly databases, you know, search engines. Um, and you can pick whatever kind of, you know, data source that you like for this. Now, I want to also mention here that there's some databases that are sprouting up that are specific to GraphQL or they have some integration with GraphQL. So example of this is FaunaDB and Neo4j and there's a bunch of other ones. I think another one is Arango has one. And my, my opinion on these is I wouldn't just pick them because you want to use GraphQL. I would look at what your data requirements are for your project and if Neo4j happens to be a good fit then it's just like a plus that they have a GraphQL integration. Because even if a database doesn't have a specific GraphQL integration, it still works with GraphQL just fine. Um, so that's kind of my opinion on those. Um, and yeah, I go with Postgres because that just happens to be my favorite database. Now I wanted to mention ORMs because you can choose whichever one you like, but you're gonna run into a problem. When I, well, not exactly a problem, but an annoyance. And I found this annoying enough that I actually switched uh, which ORM I was using. So the thing is you're going to be defining a schema for your database and you're also going to be defining a schema in GraphQL. And so now you have these two schemas that you're trying to keep in sync. So when I change a field in the uh, database, I also then have to make the change in the GraphQL schema. And so it's kind of annoying to have these things uh, separated. And so you can use SQLize or Mongoose or Objection or Next or whatever one you actually like using. Um, but I ran into a problem where I didn't like trying to sync those two, where I would have a SQLize models, and when I would change the model, I would then have to go to my GraphQL schema and edit there. Um, so Typeform is the only ORM that I know that has a nice integration with a library. So the Type GraphQL library, um, this is where if you use Typeform, I would recommend using Type GraphQL because they have this integration that looks like this over here. So what you can do is you can actually make a class and this is a database model. So you can see I have an ID here um, and I have an email and I have a password and you can see these are uh, columns in the database. And you notice I made the email a field and the ID a field here, right? And so I've decorated this with decorators 
And so the email is both a GraphQL column or GraphQL field, and it is a database column because I specified that here. And so I can define both of those using the same uh, entity it is very helpful because now if I have them in the same place, I can just remove this email and I've both removed it from the GraphQL schema and I've removed it from the database schema. And so having one place where you can kind of have a source of truth for your schema is very helpful. And you can pick and choose. Like for example, my password here, I do not want to expose that over GraphQL, so I just have it as a database column. And so type GraphQL and Typeform is what I ended up using and am using because I really like that integration. Uh, the other problem you're going to run into with GraphQL is what's called the n plus 1 problem. And basically what this comes from is when you make a GraphQL query, you're going to be making a SQL statement um, or it could be a MongoDB statement for every record. So take a look at this uh, query over here. We're fetching books and the books have an author associated to them. So you may generate uh, some SQL from that that looks like this. It's very easy for this to be generated if you're using uh, GraphQL. And so I select from book and then for each book that comes back I then am making a SQL statement for the author. And so here you can see where we're getting n plus one. For every book I'm making a SQL statement and that's very bad. It's very slow. It doesn't scale well. And so there's two tools that can help you out with this problem. One tool is called Data Loader. The other one is called Join Monster. Data loader is pretty much the standard, and this came from Facebook. Um, and basically, it turns all those SQL statements into a single SQL statement. Join Monster is a little bit more niche. I don't see as many people using it. And uh, what it does is it takes your entire GraphQL statement and resolves the entire thing with a single SQL statement. And it does a bunch of joins for you. And it computes, uh, which basically condi it conditionally joins different tables that you may need. Um, so. I would probably recommend going with data loader. That's the one I end up using the most when I'm doing this. Um, but if you don't want to even deal with this at all, another option for you is to use a GraphQL service. So these will actually handle querying the database for you. And so you don't even need to think about uh, what we discussed here, how many SQL statements are happening underneath the hood. They're going to handle that problem for you. And you don't need to worry about, for example, an ORM because these are going to replace how you are basically requesting data from the database. So let's start with AWS App Sync. So how this works is you're going to specify a schema and it's going to basically generate an API for you in the AWS cloud. And so if you want to add business logic to this, a lot of times what you're going to end up doing is they have a template language or you can create a Lambda function to handle that stuff. Now. I think really the main reason to use this or what I would recommend people using this for is if you are a front-end developer and you want to generate an API quickly and don't want to get into setting it up yourself. Now PostGraphile is the next option. This one you're going to generate a GraphQL API from a uh, Postgres database. You're basically do the same thing with Hasura and so we're going to do these two in conjunction. The main difference between these two is with PostGraphile, you're going to put your business logic into Postgres functions, whereas with Hasura, you're going to put your business logic into serverless functions. You could be using Lambda or whatever serverless um, cloud provider you like. And then with Prisma, you're going to do the same thing. The only difference is Prisma supports a few different or a few more different databases, and Prisma allows you to put your business logic in, say, JavaScript or TypeScript or whatever you're doing. Um, and so that's kind of a brief overview of the differences between these two, but that's basically um, the major differences is where you put your business logic and the databases that you're allowed to use with each one. These two you can only use with Postgres, right? This one uses, uh, I believe DynamoDB or whatever. I think you may be able to use Postgres or whatever um, RDS is available in AWS. And then Lambda functions is where you're going to put your business logic, Postgres functions, TypeScript and JavaScript, and with Hasura, it's going to be serverless functions. Now, one note I also want to talk about with Prisma is they're kind of in a weird state right now um, because they are working on Prisma 2, which is a big change from Prisma 1. And uh, Prisma 2 isn't uh, out yet for public release or general release. 
And so I'm not sure if I would recommend using Prisma right now because uh, Prisma 1 is really what you would use. And I don't know if it's worth learning Prisma 1 right now if Prisma 2 is going to be coming out soon. Um, but personally, I am using Typeform and Typegraph QL right now, but plan on checking out Prisma 2 whenever it comes out. Um, all right, so that's pretty much your GraphQL backend services and everything that's happening with that. We're now going to get into what you should use on the front end and tooling for that. So these are a couple different options you have for you to actually make GraphQL requests. And for this, I'm focusing on React because that is the framework, excuse me, library uh, that I use. Now, first one is Apollo Client. And this is the one that I use, and I would probably recommend starting with this one. This is basically the gold standard. It is orders of magnitude more popular than all the other frameworks, and it's basically slowly eating up the React world. They're just, everyone is starting to use Apollo. The number of downloads for this library is way higher than any of the other ones. And so I would recommend starting with Apollo Client. I wouldn't say it is uh, perfect. It has its warts, um, but it's going to be a standard, and a lot of companies use it. Relay is from Facebook, and it is a more complex version, I would say, than Apollo. I wouldn't say Apollo is necessarily simple, um, but Relay, I would say, is more complex and uh, has a steeper learning curve, which is one thing that I believe that's holding it back from being more popular. Um, but I think you can squeeze out some more optimizations, and the developer experience may be like, better with Relay. Um, Personally, I have not done too much with Relay, though. I have stuck to Apollo. Uh, Urkel is an interesting one that has popped up, which is a smaller bundle size to Apollo. Um, other than that, I don't know the main advantages of Urkel versus Apollo. Uh, another one that I want to mention is if you care about bundle size, um, you, can go, you can get even better than Urkel. You can go to GraphQL React. This library is even smaller. I think it's like 4 kilobytes. Um, where this, this library is pretty heavy, Apollo Client is, and you have to install GraphQL as a dependency, um, which just bogs down the weight of your bundle. Lastly, what I thought I'd mention is a new one that has popped up recently, which is uh, MobX and GraphQL mixed together, or MobX state tree. This looks really interesting. I haven't tried it yet. It's still, um, I would say, experimental, or I don't know if it's fully developed yet. Um, and so I have I would not commit to this one, but it may be a fun one to try out. Um, but again, I think Relay is a really strong option. I think Urkel is a strong option. I think GraphQL React is a strong option as well. Um, but I think Apollo Client is just eating their dinner right now. Uh, I'm I'm excited to see some of these other um, options get more popular though. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in the front end world is you can actually generate. Um, code from the GraphQL schema. And so one of the nice integrations you can get with TypeScript is it can generate all the types for you. And uh, it's one of my favorite things actually. You can get really nice auto completion with it. And there's two ways you can do this. Uh, one is with the Apollo CLI. They have some code gen. Um, but it's honestly a pretty crappy experience. Uh, the standard, and I would say way better, is GraphQL code generator. This is the one that I would recommend using. And uh, you can generate from your GraphQL schema and queries uh, actual React hooks and components that you can use, um, and it's very handy. And I'll just end this on one other thing that's been really helpful for me that I would recommend you at least checking out is this open source project called Spectrum. And this is basically a project that is running in production live, and all of its code is open source. You can see a full stack GraphQL project, what it looks like, um, and it's very helpful when using, um, comparing about when you, whenever you run into a problem with GraphQL, um, I would just come over to this library and check out reference and see what they did. And it was very helpful for me when I was learning GraphQL. So that is an overview of all the tools um, that are in GraphQL, at least some of the popular ones. And hopefully that helps you get an idea of which ones you may want to consider using.